talk on Women's Park. Um, so hello, my name is Ruth Cacavale. Thank you for coming here this evening. Um, we are thrilled to have Will Paul Thomas with us tonight. Um, he is here as part of our summer series called The Art of Renewal. For those of you visiting from outside of Westminster, I want to extend a special welcome. Thank you for coming. We're so happy to have you here. And for those folks who are in our congregation, you probably have this memorized by now, right? <laughs> we have been literally pushing this Arts of Renewal Choir. So um, uh, you've seen it so many times. For those of you from outside the congregation, we have extra copies on the table in the back. Feel free to bring the flyer. It describes the rationale for this summer series with the theme, Limping with Hope. Um, and this all our arts initiatives, which are representing the summer. So I hope you'll participate in some of the other uh, activities as well. These events are made possible by a grant from the Lilly Foundation, which has supported a sabbatical, a time of rest and restoration, for our lead minister, Chris Tuggle, and his family. This grant has also allowed our congregation to present a series of workshops and talks that speak to the arts as a vehicle for telling our individual stories of faith, hope, and spiritual renewal. At the end of the summer, we will celebrate with an exhibition of the art we've created and a fellowship supper in gratitude for the Tuttle's time of respite and return to our Westminster community. So now a little bit about Will. Uh, Will Paul Thomas was born in Chicago and now lives and works in Durham. He earned his BFA from the University of Wisconsin and his MFA from uh, UNC Chapel Hill. His work is centered on making images to record his life experiences and observations. Will creates intimate painted portraits of everyday people that he chooses as a way of recognizing their significance in his life's path. In addition to painting and drawing, he also experiments with video and photography to capture idiosyncratic, abstracted depictions of love, joy, and adversity. He is currently a visual arts instructor at Guilford College. Will has way too many exhibitions, residencies, and awards to list, but if you'd like to see more of his work locally, he is represented by Craven Art Gallery in Durham. Um, his next solo show at Craven Allen will open in September, but if you can't wait that long, he has an exhibition opening up this Friday at UNC Asheville. You can also check out his TED Talk at uh, TEDx Duke. He's a very, very busy guy. So please thank, uh, please uh, join me in welcoming Will. Thank you, Ruth, for such a warm introduction and for the invitation to come and uh, speak with this group. I'm really excited to be here to uh, share my work with you all, and especially in relation uh, to the, the theme of the, of the summer, thinking about renewal and also thinking about sort of limping forward with hope. I thought that was a really fascinating kind of uh, premise for us to all to be thinking about it for your congregation and community members to be thinking about. Uh, so I'm going to talk with you uh, for about uh, roughly 45 minutes or so, maybe a little bit less. Uh, and while I'm speaking, if there are questions that come up, I, I don't mind at all if you want to interject and uh, ask a question or have a comment. And you can also wait until uh, the end of the presentation to offer any comments or, or feedback or questions. Uh, I love being able to have conversations with people about the work. So as much as I enjoy sort of sharing and lecturing, the ideal scenario for me is to be able to uh, have people talk back and, and uh, offer suggestions and have comments. So feel free uh, when, if we get to that point and you do have questions. Um, uh, this will come up again at the end, but I included my old handle here in case you use any uh, social media. Uh, maybe you're an artist yourself or you just use uh, something like Instagram to check out other artists' work. I find a lot of my favorite artists uh, on things like Instagram, and so my handle is what you see on the screen, Will Park, the number four food. So Ruth shared a little bit about my, my background, and I want to give you some more in-depth kind of understanding about where I'm coming from to just sort of contextualize my perspective as an artist to tell you about, about where I grew up and what led me to where I am today. Uh, working here, making art in Durham. 
And I think that'll give you a sort of um, a better picture, a fuller picture of why I make the pain that I do. Um, I do a good deal of kind of self uh, analysis and assessment, and, I, and I'm always trying to figure out why, not only why I do what I do, but why other people do what they do. And as I've uh, made work over all these years, it's some things are becoming more clear to me um, day by day as I look back into my past, and I think it's really helpful to, in the classroom especially, uh, when it comes to guiding students and other people to sort of follow their instincts and follow their path without trying to sort of become something else, like really diving into who you are to make beautiful, interesting, uh, thought-provoking work. So this image that you see up on the screen is my mother, my grandmother, and uh, me as a baby. Uh, little kid and it's, it's cool to see I, I have a, a little girl uh, Indigo uh, Lou and Indigo Lou is uh, almost two and it's cool to see how much we, we uh, favor each other how much how similar we are and uh, that's a, uh, an important reflection for me because as a new father uh, so much of what I'm doing as an artist I think I'm realizing uh, the strengths that I think it gives me as a, as a father and some of the uh, challenges that I faced in life, I'm realizing how it's prepared me to uh, take on the challenge of being a father. So just to sort of mention about a shout out to my little girl, here go. <laughs> uh, so this, this is a beautiful and significant image to me for obvious reasons, because it's my mother and my grandmother. And I think what's also represented here is my mother's youth. So my, my mother and father were both 17, going on 18. Um, I think they both graduated. My mother was graduating from high school um, the same spring that I was born. Um, so she got a lot of help from my family and especially my grandmother with um, raising me and my siblings. And so I often, um, anytime I get a chance to talk about her and my life and things that I've accomplished or things I've experienced, my grandmother is like a really obvious mention. Um, so my grandmother, Carolyn Thomas, was, is, was the director of the, uh, uh, an organization on the far south side of Chicago called God's Game. And God's Game got its name uh, because it was a sort of, op in opposition to some of the gang violence and gang activity that uh, attracted young people, um, especially uh, during the time we were coming up in the uh, 80s, 90s. Uh, it grew out of a breakfast program at a AME church, St. Mary's AME church, uh, out on Dearborn Street on the south side of Chicago. And the program, the outreach organization, at first was specialized in doing like praise dances and uh, kinds of uh, interventions and activities related to educating the community and the congregation about black history and about uh, biblical history, biblical stories. So my mom would be one of the uh, members that would uh, choreograph these dances for the young people to learn and uh, and do at church and do at other off-site uh, locations. And it eventually segued into a more of a focus on uh, urban agriculture. Uh, so this was probably around the time that I was going into college. So we moved, my, me and my, my mother and my siblings, we moved from Chicago to southeastern Wisconsin, which is about two hours away from each other. Um, and so around that time is when God's game became, uh, shifted his focus more from the, being hyper-focused on what was happening in the church to more concentrated on uh, sustainable living practices for community members, so teaching people how to farm in their own neighborhoods. And so this image that you see here is my grandmother in the front, and most of these people, I was not present for this picture, so when I saw it, when I look at it later, it's cool to see it this large. At first, I was assuming that most of the people in the image were not my blood relatives, but when I look around, I think I can identify that most of them are, if not my first cousin, second cousin. Um, <laughs> like, it's real literally family here. A couple people I don't recognize, and they very, very well may be cousins that I haven't met. But God's gang was comprised of not just my family, this is just a small, a small group relative to the people that participated in the program. So it was really geared towards the people in the neighborhood uh, where the church was situated. So the St. Mary's AME Church, was, again, was on the far south side, but it was kind of in the center of the uh, Robert Taylor homes, which is one of the high-rise um, developments that was uh, torn down around the late 90s. 
Uh, so we didn't live in Robert Taylor homes, but we attended church there. And I learned later that my grandmother attended that church because of a love for her mother-in-law. And so I'm just, it's interesting learning about your history, uh, things that you don't realize when you're a child, you know, and you, you're, uh, you tag along to do things, um, whether or not you want to, or you, you, don't, you don't have a trait, right? So we went to church every Sunday, of course, in addition to Sundays, we participated in guys' gang activities. Um, and that's a weird phrase, God, gang activities. I was like, but, but <laughs> we were on the up and up, right? That, that was the whole purpose of it, that we were providing uh, services and we were part of that. So it's not even so much uh, we were doing this for them or the people in the neighborhood. It was like it was all of us in this together. So I grew up with a sort of, uh, I think, embedded in my experience, service was like a sort of, um, a given activity or attribute of like what we came up doing. Um, so I realized as time went on how important that work was and as a painter, as an artist, I think that's um, become a part of the way I think about the paintings I make to be in service. Um, and in a different way, but still focused on community and focused on the people that you can spend time with. So. Sometimes I'm placing what I do in sort of opposition to, uh, I'm, I'll backtrack to that Planet Dream slide. So the tradition of painting portraits of people that are wealthy or well-known or popular or political figures, all of those people have paintings made of them for, for good reason. Um, whether it's because they can afford it or they want to be celebrated or they, other people want to celebrate them. And so my, the premise that I've been operating on for some time now has been painting the people in my life, whether they be relatives or strangers, people that I want to get to know better. So this is a painting of my grandmother uh, that was shown at the Museum of Science and Industry as a part of the Black Creative, Creative, Creativity Exhibition. That's an annual show that happens uh, there. And I think this might have been around somewhere between 09 and 11. But a really awesome moment to be able to share the likeness of someone who's been such a, a tremendous part of my, my upbringing and uh, such a positive influence on my life. And it's, as you can see, it's not a small painting, right? So it's <laughs> like, like uh, about four, four feet high. And, and that's intentional, right? So I, could, I make miniature paintings often or small drawings, uh, but for this woman in particular, uh, this painting might be too small to sort of fully represent <laughs> the influence and impact that she's had on my life. Uh, and to just backtrack a little in thinking about what God's gang represented in that segue that we had to uh, urban agriculture. So the logo that you see here originally or most of the time had God's gang uh, centered on it. And so Planning Dreams was sort of a, uh, an outlet or a, an offshoot. Of, uh, of, of God's game, focus on urban agriculture. So, another little cute kid picture. Uh, and even my, my sisters are, are represented here, and this is in our, uh, in the front area, like near our front door in the apartment that we lived in. So I mentioned that we didn't live in uh, Robert Taylor homes, but we did live in uh, in a public housing project. So we lived not far from my grandmother who owned her own home. She was one of her, the first in her family to own a home. But my mother, having had us young, um, wanted to do her own thing, and this was her sort of getting away from home and trying to make it on her own. And so she moved us out to uh, Agel Gardens, which is a further south from um, where my grandmother lived. So we went to a private uh, Catholic school and, again, helped with the help of my grandmother who paid our, from what I understand, helped pay our tuition there, but it was really, our education was really important to her, and she observed when my mother was coming up the differences between the education at a private school versus a public school in the same area, so it was important to her. Um, both the Catholic school and the uh, public school were in very, very close walking distance, so we could walk less than 10 minutes to get to school, and we often would, so me, Jennifer, and Angelica would walk around the corner to go to school, and not, so I went to this school first, through fifth grade. And this uh, image of my, my first grade class, I think is important in terms of me 
choosing models today and thinking about the interaction that I have with um, everyone that I've had interaction with throughout my life. And so, as you can see, all the kids um, are other black kids. And so my experience from uh, first through fifth grade was in, in a school setting was being in relationship as far as my peers with other black kids in that church. It was an all black church. Uh, so the only people that weren't black that I came into regular contact with were some of the clergy at the Catholic school. Um, so some of the sisters and uh, I think my, my third grade teacher was uh, Brother Tim. Um, and so Tim, Brother Tim was a white guy, Sister Judith was our, our white principal, but my regular experience was uh, an interaction with my peer group and the people that I was influenced by were black students up into uh, sixth grade. So when we moved to Wisconsin, I moved to, to Beloit, as I mentioned, and that the demographics of Beloit, I want to say, are somewhere around like maybe 14% uh, black African American right now. And so that number is probably close to what it was in 1996. Uh, so a more diverse, uh, but now I became more of a minority, right? So I went from this experience of like my norm being, being around other black kids, uh, other black people at church, my family, you know, uh, and community being mostly black, uh, to have this other experience where race now like sort of took a different, played a different role in my lived experience. So it was maybe something that came up more in conversations, not that we were unaware before the sixth grade, uh, but it just became, if, if kids were teasing each other about like what you wore to school or about your family, now another sort of point to tease people about is like race for kids of that age. And I kind of count that as something when we think about adversity, relatively, I won't say harmless, but uh, compared to some of the experience, lived experiences of people in my own family, people in our community who had experienced uh, literal physical violence or other kinds of violence or abuse related to racial difference, sometimes I reflect on the experience and think, oh, it wasn't that bad, or sometimes I, I think, well, it's, it, bad enough, it was sort of uh, jarring enough where it became a regular part of my conscience to think about how much is my experience being impacted by this, this change in the demographics of the place, place that I go to school or, or and the place that I live. So from sixth grade through graduate school to now, I'm, I, feel, I find myself in way more diverse uh, settings and I would say that Durham is probably unique compared to where I went to college. Uh, is unique in that it's more uh, more diverse and more black than I um, I, I understood before I, I came to uh, North Carolina. And so I'm, I really am hyper aware and hyper focused on race. So if you can imagine sort of us switching positions, whatever, I can't help but like acknowledge the difference in demographic between myself and, and most of the audience, right? So, but it's something that I've leaned into to help me not only help me understand my experiences, but to have conversations with others about what is it like for you? What is it, do you think about it at all? And if you do, why? And if you don't, like, what is it it's like to experience uh, a reality where it's not a sort of, like, regular uh, part of your consciousness? Um, so, to show another painting here of someone as close to me, this is a painting of my father beside a drawing that I made of him 20 years earlier. Uh, and just to show some of the, I guess the, my attention to the people in my life even before it became a thing that I understood the conceptual uh, sort of weight of that as a college student learning about art and why certain things are important, I knew, uh, as a kid, that to make a picture of somebody was a special thing. So maybe if I can ask the group, and it may be, maybe this is everyone, or maybe it's a few of you, I would be interested to see, how many of you have had someone paint a portrait of you just by a show of hands? Someone else paint a portrait of you? So a few people, okay. How many of you have painted a portrait of someone else? Okay, so a few hands went up. So I'm sure that all of you, whether you had your, painted, your portrait painted or someone else painted your portrait can attest to that usually happens based on some kind of special circumstance. If that person is special, uh, there's uh, some exchange of resources involved, somebody's paying you to do it, or you, you're being, uh, your portraits are being paid for, uh, but it's typically relegated to uh, these special circumstances. And if you have an oil painting uh, made of you, I think that becomes a little bit 
more special. So not everybody's like sitting around making oil paintings. And my father is someone, as far as I know, who has never had a, a painting uh, made of him. Um, so back then, making this pen drawing of him on like line notebook paper to 2018, making this uh, you know five foot painting of him on oil painting, the idea is still the same to sort of celebrate, to honor, to uh, show the reverence that I have for this person that's a, that's special in my life without waiting for somebody else to sort of determine that he's worthy of that uh, or sh should be recognized in this way. Um, and also what's, what's wrapped up in these images, what I, what I learned again after sort of looking back into all these paintings is the insistence on painting people that I don't have regular access to. And so I showed that, that image in the beginning of my mother and my grandmother who I saw all the time growing up. My dad, I think we only lived him, my mother, and myself together for maybe like the, maybe before I started first grade for a, a few years there. But after that, uh, at a certain point, he moved to Tennessee, so I would see it less and less, and I had counted that I, there was a period we didn't see each other for like 14 years, but we, we spoke often, so it didn't even register that we hadn't seen each other in person. We spoke on the phone so often. But my father follows or falls within the pattern of me painting individuals who I want to get to know better, who I uh, don't get to see often. And, it, and I think that was something that sort of happened by accident um, or as a way of me following my intuition, not something that I sort of built into these painting projects that I did. It was like people that I had in my life that I wanted to be able to spend time with uh, and the painting became a kind of excuse to do that. If I invite you to make a painting of you, the time that I spend photographing you for that painting, we get to have a conversation about whatever. So whether it's a casual conversation or a serious conversation, it's a chance for me to uh, sort of get to know you that much better. And a brief mention of the difference between those kind of paintings, these personal paintings, and uh, commission work is that I, I do sort of diversify what I do in terms of uh, recognizing other individuals that are more well-known. And so Professor Julius Chambers, formal, formal uh, former, uh, Chancellor of North Carolina Central and professor at the UNC School of Law, Civil Rights, a uh, hero and an attorney. Uh, I had an opportunity to paint him, and so I still open myself up to these other opportunities, but I always, it's always important for me to acknowledge and highlight the individuals that I can have regular conversations with. This image was made from a black and white, based on a black and white photo that I was given, or that I found of uh, Professor Chambers and not uh, of course, he, he passed before I had the opportunity to uh, the pleasure of meeting him. Uh, so I don't necessarily uh, sort of deride or think there's anything wrong with painting well-known individuals. And I think what better person in terms of somebody that's well-known to represent than somebody sort of fighting for human and civil rights. This scripture... Uh, I've used in a separate presentation, and I thought it would be relevant for a, a group that is uh, a faith-based group, a Christian group, especially. And so having grown up in an Amy church and a Pentecostal church myself, scripture often comes to mind, and this is one that I had come across years ago that I felt like was related to uh, my pursuits and the ideals that I hope me and my loved ones can embody more and more. Um, so as you can see, it says, The king will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Uh, the, for more context about that uh, scripture, just before, then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. So I think if we continue down the trajectory about the things that we do for uh, the people in our environment, the people in our world, strangers or not, um, whether it's offering clothes, food, support, shelter, uh, I think to have the opportunity to listen to each other, to see each other, to me, falls in line with that same kind of thinking. 
Because so often, if you think about just your daily activity, of whether it's running errands, going to the store, you encounter people who you see them, like they're maybe in your peripheral vision, or you see them, you see a cashier, but how often do you have exchanges where you really are acknowledging uh, with any kind of depth the people that you encounter on a regular basis? And I consider and my, my own interpretation of this kind of the least of, of these is the people that don't fall into our immediate sort of circles of people that we care about, right? So our, our family units, our friends, whatever your sphere of people includes, there most people fall outside of that. So for me, the least of these is thinking about the people that you either think don't have anything to offer you, or they maybe literally don't have anything to offer you uh, in terms of material possessions, uh, material uh, kinds of things, but what do we lose when we miss the opportunity to uh, have an exchange with someone that sort of deepens our understanding of who, who they are and give them an opportunity to understand who we are. And so that's, that premise is something that's regularly sort of circulated in my mind about what kind of exchange can I have with someone who I might otherwise just sort of pass by um, and not think twice about. And they might see me and not think twice about me. And so this, this whole pain project has really become one of trying to connect, not only me connecting to individuals, but to connect individuals to each other. So the two women that you see in this image were uh, both friends of mine who didn't know each other before the painting behind them was made. And so I kind of started treating my painting practice as a, way, as a social networking practice. I wanted people who, were, we all went to the same school, but I knew that there were certain circles, uh, certain cliques and groups that didn't overlap. And since I was a part of those different groups, I wanted to find ways to connect them. Not always thinking about like sort of what what that would mean in the long run, but at least initiating these kind of interactions, even if they just sort of even if they stopped at the exhibition, uh, at the uh, opening, right? So people met and had pleasant exchanges. If if that's all it was, I was happy for that. So in addition to painting, uh, people who share a similar ethnic background I also have kind of expanded my my reach and the paintings that I do to uh, people of different ethnicities based on the same premise of wanting people who may see themselves as different to connect to each other, to think about the ways that they're, some of the ways that they're different may be apparent, but the similarities that they share in common may not be as apparent, so wanting to find ways to facilitate an exchange that helps people know who's sharing space with them. And so along those lines, uh, this image that you see here is on the left, two art friends of mine from college, and then the image on the right are uh, my fraternity brothers uh, uh, from the Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. And so uh, this organization is plays a really unique part in, in my life because many of the guys that I joined the organization with, I would say that they were very uh, outwardly social, outgoing people that seemed to have like big friend groups, like really close friends, and I, at a certain point in my life, uh, early on in my life, was sort of kind of, I would develop these superficial relationships with friends, but kind of isolate myself. And to join the organization, I, my draw to it initially was just out of curiosity of what all this could be about, and it was a lot of kind of criticism in mind. Uh, and so what I was able to do was to uh, connect myself to men, that young men that we had a lot of common and we had a lot that we uh, where our experiences diverge and to see that kind of diversity amongst a group that you might think is homogenous, right? So you see a 20 year old, uh, nine, 20 year old black man out, being outside of the group, you might assume that they share so much in common, but I, I think the kind of way that I was educated on my own. Uh, stereotypes that I would place on people that belong to my same uh, sort of demographic, thinking about other African American men sort of falling into these narrow categories of experience. I was able to learn through that group for myself as a young man just how diverse our lived experiences are, even when going in with these assumptions that all these guys are the same and I'm the only one that's different, and realizing how flawed that sort of thinking was. And I include these images side by side because my friend Eric whose head is circled on the left, and my friend Darian on the right, uh, don't know each other, and I think didn't know each other at the time we were in school, so I made a painting of, of those two men, and, and 
forced them into this <laughs> circle together. <laughs> right? um, and so it's, it's really been a process of trying to bring together these worlds that seem so disparate to me. And in the case of uh, Ruby and Jen, those two women got to meet each other. I don't know that Eric and Darian ever had a chance to meet. Uh, and whether or not the viewer knows the, uh, the subjects, is the fact that you don't know them is actually a part of the, the concept as well, and that they could be anyone. They may look very similar to people that you actually do know. And in Durham, uh, when you start to see paintings of people uh, that I make in a triangle, they may very well be people that you actually do know in person. And so this phenomenon of seeing paintings, not of people that are either distant historical figures or famous people that we, some of us won't ever meet, but that they're local community members. So this slide is a combination of people that are from back in Wisconsin, but also some people that are uh, here uh, in North Carolina. So it's uh, Erica and Lamar and Phil are all arts and art supporters uh, here in the Triangle. That if you're involved in the arts community here, they may very well people that you've been in the same room with. If, if you, if, and you may know them personally. So I just love this idea of like the people that we see, see represented could literally be the people that we actually have a chance to have personal conversations with. Um, so the work that I was making that was focused on highlighting individuals was also about these racial differences. And so I began to sort of draw attention to the demographics of the room. When I was, had finished undergrad at University of Wisconsin Whitewater, uh, I was still involved in the arts community, and the arts community was made up of mostly uh, retired uh, white people. And I was very happy to participate in the community, and I was embraced, and people uh, always uh, made me feel welcome. And it was a small group, and probably a typical reception would include maybe half the size of this group. So it was a really small community. Uh, so I say all that to say I was intentionally painting pictures of black people and showing them in spaces where the audience was predominantly white, and I wondered what that meant to that audience. If they were looking at people that they did or didn't have relationships with people that looked like the, the group of people that I was sharing. So even with all of that, I thought that I was having these conversations that you could get, a, you could have an hour-long conversation with someone and not mention race. And I thought, that's fine, that's, that's good. Even. But if I want us to pay attention to and think about what this means for us in this society where race plays such a heavy role for so many people, what does it mean to direct people's attention to that uh, in a sort of, um, sort of subtle and not so subtle way? And so this image you see here is of my friend Anthony, another Durham artist, um, that I manipulated his skin color. And there's more variation in the actual uh, image that doesn't show up on the a projection here, but I did alter the skin to be darker. And this uh, sort of sketch, the digital sketch, was the precursor to these paintings of men and boys with their face painted half blue. So instead of continuing that direction of having people's skin be darkened, um, to turn black or dark gray, I opted to change the coloration to sort of contrast with the warm skin tone. Um, and when I started this, this series, I didn't really think of it as a series that would go on as long as it has, but I started with this painting of my nephew Michael, and I altered the color, color of his skin without a lot of conceptual forethought about what that would, would mean and what it would mean to other people, but I knew that it was a way to highlight his skin color or to highlight this change that it happened. So I, I had assumed that the conversations would have to change to not just how beautiful or interesting or emotional portraits were, but to start to consider or figure out why the boy's skin had turned to some unnatural color. And in thinking about the follow-up to that conversation, talking about skin color, in my mind, is sort of a natural segue to race within the society that we live in, in, in one way, shape, or form. And as you can see, the painting is named after my, my sister, um, Dennis First. There's an important element that I want to uh, highlight here before I, I, I talk around it or ramble too much about acknowledging. Mikey's skin turning this sort of bluish gray color, 
I did at the time, even though I hadn't had, I, I hadn't identified the series of portraits the way that they're identified now. I did think about that as representing a kind of lifelessness. Um, and I hadn't decided whether that was something that was sort of overcome, over, coming over him or he was being relieved from. And my intention was to sort of leave it uh, open to the, uh, to the audience. And part of this consideration was about a kind of thinking of an individual considering their place in the world and when we hear all of these different stories about uh, the way people are victimized, whether by their peers or by people in authority, what it means to sort of go out into the world considering that you may very well be a victim of that, whether or not you have done anything to sort of warrant uh, that kind of response to your person, right? That you could be uh, the next person to have somebody lash out at you uh, just because you're a black boy or a black man. Um, and I'm putting all of that on this painting and paintings like it without an extensive conversation with the individual. Like, so Mikey was five when I made, when I took the photos for this painting of him. I didn't have that conversation with Mikey about like police brutality or things like that. But my, the sort of thread that follows all of these paintings is even if you don't think about it, if it's not a part of your concern when you go out on a daily basis that I imagine that to be true for all the men, women, and children, for so many of the men, women, and children that have experienced that kind of violence, that it's not something maybe on the top of your mind, uh, but that, that it can happen, that it's part of the identity that you've been born into. So even if you like have managed to not be as hyper-obsessed or hyper-focused on it as I have to be, it's still part of like the identity that you have been born into that, regardless of how you think about it, has an impact on your the trajectory of your life. So these these paintings are multifaceted in that they represent something larger than the subject in terms of thinking about these societal pressures and adversities that people experience, but also are again a way for me to recognize and document people in my life that are important to me. So Mikey has a couple is represented a couple times in the series and maybe about 10 years apart from each other, not, maybe not that, but he's almost 18 now, so this is, I think, around the time when he was about 10 was this, when the second portrait was made. Um, and you can see how our hair has sort of migrated from one part of our head to the other. He has more hair on his head now, and I have less hair on my face. It's funny how that happens. Um, my brother, Anthony, is a part of the series. So, painting of him on the left. I can address the sort of headlessness thing. <laughs> that's, uh, that's probably where to throw the image in there without talking about it, but if you have questions about that, I can talk about it later. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> yeah, me and my brother, uh, who, of course, I love, and thinking about him being my brother, but also being a young black man within the society that we live in and wondering what that experience is like. So uh, Paul McGee is another person uh, that I've added to the series. So there's a, a, a bunch of different men that you'll see in this series. And Paul is, his significance, part of his significance of being in the series, that he was added because of my lack of being able to include other male members of my family. So when this series started, when these few paintings that began the series started, I was trying to record men that were my blood relatives. But since I moved from the Midwest and hadn't made it back frequently enough, I only had photos uh, that I had taken myself of my brother and my nephew. So the other men and boys that might have been included, I hadn't had pictures of them yet. So I, had, I wanted the project to continue, so I had to expand the way I was thinking about who would be included in the project. So I sort of, I guess, broke my own rule and changed the definition to um, people that look like family members. <laughs> <laughs> and so Paul actually he, he resembled a, another family member and I named the painting after that family member. Um, and so then after that I just started to open it up to, to, to black men that I had connections with, whether I, I, I met him through another um, art friend, one of my best friends, when he came to play a jam session um, at, when I was at, at grad school at UC Chapel Hill. Um, unfortunately Paul passed um, about three years ago, I think just at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, I was really uh, happy to be introduced to him because he was a, 
Uh, another individual that I, I learned so much from just from having casual conversation and just a reminder of how valuable this process could be, excuse me, uh, even before the painting is in the, in the gallery, is that I've had an opportunity to have an exchange with someone and learn something about the world that I didn't know before. So this painting is on display at Duke's uh, Broadcast Center, uh, the West Union, part of their uh, collection. Why you decided to have that Thank you. Uh, yeah, so just like Anthony, his, his, uh, Anthony's eyes were closed as well. Oh, I'm sorry. As well, right? Um, and then I had Paul's eye closed. And again, thinking about what I was representing with Mikey's portrait, this kind of lifelessness was um, as morbid as this, this is, I wanted to sort of delve into the depth of us not knowing, of the audience not knowing whether or not that we were looking at a, per a picture of a person that was deceased or at rest, and really relying on your own experience and your own sort of psychological disposition to sort of determine that. Are you looking at a, at a death mask of someone? Are you looking at someone sort of with their eyes just sort of resting for a moment? Um, and unfortunately, the, the sort of uh, the sort of that coming to, to, to fruition in a way with having uh, us having lost Paul, uh, but how all of us are sort of on that uh, sort of edge right between life and death, and maybe even more so if we consider ourselves to be uh, sort of uh, subject to or vulnerable to these forces that can take our lives. So the blue. Presenting the police brutality, or you just resent, yeah, and, and also blue, the color sad, or I mean, how does that? That's, I mean, that's a really a perfect time question. And so, this image of uh, from one of the protests for Eric Garner, who before we before we lost George Floyd, uh, I stated I can't breathe several times was. There's a correlation there, but it's not intended to be fixed to police brutality or any kind of brutality at all, really. But I think you can't, because of instances like the death of Eric Garner, George Floyd, etc., it's hard to sort of separate those, um, that phenomenon out from it, like that people have um, sort of in their last breath uh, experience that, that kind of brutality. Uh, so. I think at the time the series began, which was at the end of uh, 2015, my intention was to continue to do what I have been doing in terms of representing individuals, but to not sort of ignore these instances of police brutality or other kinds of brutality, so that I think it's a reflection of my own ex lived experience of feeling like I lead a totally normal life, and I also get the news and have uh, people my, in my life who experience these kind of um, intense levels of violence, right? So I'm not like immune to it, I'm, I'm, I'm aware of it, and at the same time I'm trying to sort of uh, lead whatever I'm thinking of as a normal kind of life. So that's why I sort of have and have, right, in that. Um, I do believe that it, it, at any moment I, I, I trust that I'll be protected, but that you never know in what ways that you might be facing kind of similar circumstance to somebody put in those positions. Um, so that's why I included this image of uh, Eric Garner, is that it wasn't made in response to that or as a, uh, as a result of it, but it was made with the realization that that is a reality. Yeah. So. This image of, in Raleigh of Anthony and my best friend Antoine. Yeah. So what you'll see when I show more of the images together is that I've been playing around with this color spectrum. So I've, I've changed the background color so that when they're displayed, I have this opportunity to play around with the placement. So when I had only had a few of them, I didn't have a sort of spectrum represented. So you got a black one next to a green one. But as more of them were made, I would make variations of green, variations of red, so that by the time, by the time they were installed on the gallery wall, I could play around with the configurations, whether or not they sort of followed that um, sort of color spectrum or broke up the spectrum. So it was kind of thinking about the actual, them as a group. And, and again, not placing too much emphasis on the specific meanings of the colors, but allowing you as an audience to it to sort of determine how you see that green being interpreted. How did you decide, I was someone on the top of the 
bottom half is colored in. Some of them the bottom half. Yeah. Yeah. And there was another. There was another place that I gave myself a rule um, that you'll see. I have like broken the rule at different times. Where if they were younger than me, then the blue patches would be over the top of their face, and if they were older than me, that would be on the bottom half of their face. So it was another kind of marker of my specific relationship to them. Um, you've seen instances where you would assume that that our age difference is not what uh, that doesn't align with that rule, and it was. Uh, I'll point it out, and you'll see it anyway, but uh, where I forgot my own rule, <laughs> and I just, I made it far enough in the paint where I'm, I'm just keeping going anyway. <laughs> so, but that was the general uh, rule that I decided on. Uh, so, this is a woman that was included in this, in this what I've been terming the Cyanosis Project, but is a, a, an outlier in that I chose to to sort of revert from this and focus specifically on black men. Not to say that black women or people of other ethnicities don't experience the same kind of uh, experience with adversity and unknown adversities that you, you will encounter in life, but to do what you do when you're doing research in college in that you narrow your focus to a particular group or topic or idea. So this series could easily be of 40 black women um, or uh, 30 Latinx children, right? You could transpose it to kind of any group of people, but my focus, I thought it made more sense coming from my perspective to focus specifically on, on black men. Yeah. Maybe I missed this, but what's the symbolism of the blue? So, it's two, it's a couple of different answers. That one, which I decided a few paintings to the series, I called the whole series Cyanosis. And some of you may be familiar with the term, if you're not, silos refers to a blueness of the skin that results from improperly oxygenated blood. So I thought of it as this blue in my series is a kind of exaggeration or metaphor for that loss of oxygen. Uh, and so that these men weren't literally being deprived of oxygen, but they were being deprived of some other essential need, whether it's psychological, emotional, etc. But I say, well, I say there's multiple answers. There have been responses to these paintings that have made me think differently about what the blue could represent. So before I tell you that that's what it began to represent for me, you all may have had different interpretations about what it looks like to you. And in some cases, people have talked about the blue as being something empowering, empowering, empowers people in the uh, portraits. Uh, the, so blue, uh, for some people, symbolize royalty, or calm, or cool. And so I really wanted to embrace this idea that even though I had like fixed my mind on blue being about some kind of deprivation, that however you saw the blue sort of operating or do, uh, activating the person, it was that. And I almost I tried to be more careful as, as many times as I've talked about this work and talked about it being the Cyanosis series, not narrowing into that so that when people did see this as being something more positive, that it could be that as well. But for me, blue became a kind of like metaphor for uh, breathlessness in other ways that we might experience that outside of literally the oxygen. Thank you for that question. Was there another uh, hand back there? Yeah. As an artist, like, how do you, um, when you start a series like that, do you, I'm curious, do you have an, like an expectation of how that might be received and, and how has it been received? And, and uh, can you just speak to, um, uh, is it something you, you just disregard? Is it, is it important is it, as an artist to you? Yeah, great question. I, I think you, I think I have expectations that people will appreciate the quality of the painting and when it's time to sort of like show the work publicly that people will mostly be congratulatory, which I'm grateful for because you don't want to go to a show and everybody like criticizing you. Like, <laughs> I'm grateful that people are like nice about it. But what I'm really curious about, though, is what people think of it, you know, when I'm not with an earshot or what people see in it. And what I've been grateful for is when people have been honest about the sort of, I guess, problematic parts of it. And I'll give you, I guess, like a, a, one good example is that my mother specifically felt kind of concerned with it because she sees it as a kind of, not wallowing in, but a kind of representation of the, the, the negative experiences uh, of being a black person, right, of something that, of, of this focus on death. She, she's not into that, and especially seeing her 
uh, grandson and son represented that way. She always tells me, like, paint us happy, son. And I'm like, yeah, it's, it's, I, I will or I can in some other format. I actually have a project of people just like smiling or whatever, but I'm, I'm, I'm sort of I'm really interested in showing these other dimensions of who we are. And, that, and, it's, and a person not smiling doesn't always mean that they're not happy. And I think that's really important to me. So if the expectation when somebody points a camera at you is that you smile, I didn't want this painting series to sort of resemble that expect that same expectation or that same pattern. So I would say that to answer your question about like expectations, I think I expect people to want to know what it means. Like want to know what I think it means. Um, and I am I'm okay with that, but what I've been trying to encourage people to do when I'm present is to embrace your own interpretation of it. So I think there's this dance with like, yeah, there's a thing that I thought that this work should mean, but I'm the kind of artist that's open to a variety of interpretation because it teaches me so much, whether historically or in the contemporary sense. Somebody mentioned to me when I showed this work uh, down there in Charlotte, they asked if I was familiar with like dying of like indigo. And I hadn't thought about Indigo Dying when I was making this series, uh, but that's the reference that was relevant to them. They thought it had something to do with that. And I didn't want to take that away from the series. I'm like, I'm, I won't claim it as my own idea, but I think there's something really powerful about people being able to reference these other uh, parts of our uh, life and history that they see represented in these paintings. Um, another reference that I thought was really powerful was Hank Blue. And some of you may be familiar yeah. with that, and I wasn't at the time it was mentioned to me, but uh, this woman, um, she talked about homes, especially the so southeastern tradition, especially it seems where uh, the ceilings and sometimes on the porch are painted blue to guide spirits sort of right. uh, into the next uh, sort of realm. And so she saw this as being a kind of representation of that sort of spiritual connection of trying to guide spirits uh, into the next life. So I thought that was a really beautiful interpretation, but not my intention. And so I'm more open to that, and I want that more than trying to fix these pains to any one idea. So that's why I'm I'm really glad that it's, I'm glad it's not immediately apparent what it means. Um, I don't want to make paintings like that. I want it to be an opportunity for the viewer to like have to think about it, figure it out um, before I sort of give it away. And I hope that once I've given it away, it still is open to that. Um, and it's just more paintings from the series. And I should be mindful, mindful and respectful of, of, of you all time. I know that we're close to seven now. I'm glad uh, that you've asked me questions kind of along the way. Uh, <coughs> again, this this painting, this particular painting series uh, is comprised of close to 40 paintings that are about two by three feet and then other paintings that are smaller. Uh, and they've been shown kind of around the, around the state in different places. And I never make assumptions about what kind of adversity the model is experiencing. So my cousin here, uh, Michael, Auntie Chris's uh, grandson, um, is about 13 uh, now. And so I think I assume that Michael and Mr. James Gatson, um, who we picture here together, have experienced different kinds of adversity in their lives. Uh, James passed a few years ago, I think it's the late 70s or early 80s. Um, and Michael is, you know, um, out here doing his, his thing. Actually, he's in Chicago. And rather than try to uh, project onto or assume that all black men and boys are experiencing the same kind of adversity, what I know to be true is that if you're alive in this world, you will encounter some adversity, some challenge, some conflict. And the way that you process that, the way that you live your life, experience that, knowing that to be true. Um, I think I learned through these interactions with these men, with my younger family members, about how well I've done that or not, and how they've managed it. James had a story for me about, I think around the time when he first moved to Chapel Hill in the early 70s, he was like the first black faculty member in the art department. And he went to some store and some kid way younger than he was disrespected him, called him a boy or something silly like that. James' choice was to put the kid in check. And this is uh, early 70s Chapel Hill. And you all that have come up around here may know better than me kind of what that m might sort of mean or result in. 
I'm making an assumption coming from the Midwest and thinking in the South that that's uh, risky or anywhere is, is, is risky to sort of respond that way. But also, I understand Chapel Hill, Chapel Hill to be and be more progressive in some instances. Uh, he, so he's a faculty member at a uh, university and he's responding to this kid's disrespect with like intolerance. He's like, like not accepting and speaking to him um, disrespectfully. But all of that to say that I, I think that my experience, the experience of my younger cousins, my brother, is this kind of expectation of being safe even when we try to sort of put somebody in check about disrespecting us, like this assumption that it won't result in like um, violence or a death threat for your family or something. Um, so think about the sort of generational differences of experience and racial conflict. Even if we could say that things have advanced or things are better, even when we recognize things that ways that things have changed, that is still sort of consideration that my being having a certain complexion will impact the interaction that I have with somebody in a negative way that could result in one or both of us being uh, victimized in some way. Uh, so there's this thread that's carried through even if yours isn't the sort of heightened version of that like racial adversity. Um, and from what I can tell from having spent time with James is that he, he seemed to have enjoyed a, like, a successful career raised beautiful children, grandchildren, uh, and had a pretty uh, great go at it. Um, but this idea of having to sort of grapple with that identity and how it impacts your day-to-day -day experience and do the regular stuff, like live, raise a family and have a career, is my suggestion is that that's, that's complicated. And that's a weird sort of like dance to play, except to have a conversation with somebody and to like want to be normal and you or that person can't get over uh, the sort of racial difference between you, right? That that sort of becomes a kind of barrier for one or both of you to try to traverse as you interact with each other. So really, this is there's a ton of self-reflection in this and that. It's not always me saying that the person I'm speaking to is sort of disenfranchising me or discriminating against me. It's like what this sort of uh, racist institution of the, in our society has done is sort of made it so that uh, what might be a normal interaction becomes this other, more uh, layered thing because of the psychological impact that it has. So even if it doesn't like uh, evolve to or devolve to violence, it's still this sort of psychological thing that's hovering over. So this is the image that I mentioned in terms of the mistake that I made. The, uh, <laughs> we, we not that, I'm not that old. <laughs> So o Obi, it's funny I say I'm with Obi because this man, he's a carpenter and I think he's still working like today. So he does some things that I, I, I can't do, I, I don't do uh, in terms of like his, his physical um, fitness. Uh, so we met on a project uh, where I was contributing paintings to um, a hotel renovation and he was doing the carpentry work uh, for them. And this is Obi with his, uh, his daughter Tamara who the painting is named after. And this was at the, the National Museum's uh, Record and Resilience Exhibition last year. Are you intentional about um, relating these types of women? Absolutely, absolutely. So after the painting of Paul, which was named after a family member, the pattern that I followed was that they would always be named after women or girls in the men's life as a way of suggesting that if nobody else cares about them, which is not true for any of them, but their, their mother, daughter, sister care about them. So if what we need to sort of honor, respect, uh, regard with dignity, the next person is to consider like that somebody loves them, then so be it, right? Like, if my treatment of you, to, to take it back to this, the, the title that I wanted to sort of be the umbrella of this is Victor Ken, the people that I regard in my family unit with a certain kind of care and compassion, what would it mean if I extended that to you all? So even though we're not blood relatives, what if I wasn't so quick to get angry if you did something that I thought offended me. What if there was more forgiveness allowed for you? Uh, the way I might think about my brother is that my brother might upset me, but he's always going to be my brother. We always going to come back together. Uh, so what does it mean to sort of extend that compassion, that thoughtfulness, that care to the people, to everybody, right? And not just the people in your circle. How safe, how much safer would we all be? How, how um, might it feel if I knew that uh, falling out wasn't going to be like 
the end of things or whatever because we're family and you can't, as much as you might want to, you can't sort of like divorce somebody from your, your bloodline, right? So what if I thought about that spiritually or uh, extended to all the people in my community? Kwaku uh, was an, an artist I met at the Nasher, a uh, great friend of mine, and this is a fun uh, title painting. It's Tui, it's a language his, him and his wife were of Ghanaian descent, um, and they didn't have a son at the time his painting was made, but they now have a son, his son is Oheni, so Oheni being chief, uh, this painting was titled this before Oheni was born, so I always thought it was this kind of sweet connection between Kwaku um, being Afu is uh, sort of the queen mother's chief, and now they have their own little chief. Uh, <laughs> okay. I'm painting of a, a distant family member who is down in Atlanta. Apparently, he hadn't been to a gallery or museum, and so how special to go to a gallery or museum and see yourself uh, represented. <laughs> And again, not because you've been victimized or you're some political or famous person, just because you're uh, part of my my family, my extended family. Um, so my, I mean, I think my, 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 what I hope is represented here is if you don't already have a practice of doing so, finding creative ways to celebrate the people in your life, not necessarily like through portraits if that's not your thing, but ways to acknowledge, to observe, to appreciate people that maybe uh, sidestep some of like, like birthdays or holidays or special occasions, adversities and things like that. What does it look like to sort of celebrate and acknowledge individuals in your circle um, just because you love them right? or because you want to get to know them better? So some artists in our community uh, our supporters, you have Mike Williams, Stephen Hayes, a young man I met through um, the National Museum's uh, National Teen Council program, another artist, Richard on uh, in, who's a very talented, amazing pastel artist. And none of the men you see sitting with me in this image are actually represented on the wall. Uh, but again, like realizing that as artists, when you show your work, the given that people hopefully are going to come together and come see it, that this is like, this is becomes a kind of glue for people, right? Is that I'm showing a paint, I'm, I'm doing this kind of thing that I hope is multifaceted, and I'm celebrating the people you see in the paintings, and hopefully they get to show up. And even if they they are not able to, the people that come are able to celebrate it, uh, see the community together. That's part of the process is photographing individuals and images. Did you see in the paintings? And I, I, I should ask my mom if it would be sufficient to her if she saw the men smiling with her hand <laughs> <laughs> to know if that like made it okay. Or something. They're okay. They're okay. They're very well adjusted, happy uh, in the middle. <laughs> and, and to see the excitement, there's a video that I didn't include here, but of uh, of Marley Masai's uncle of Travis uh, coming to see the painting when I was working at a, I had a residency at the Rubenstein Art Center. He came to see the painting. Um, and I think he put his mom on FaceTime um, and was just like, had this a level of excitement that I hadn't experienced, like somebody encountering their, their, their portrait. He was really emotional about it. And then her response, even though she was seeing it like via FaceTime, was kind of remarkable. And, and in terms of the things that I learned about these paintings, um, his mother is Taino and talked about like it reminding that blue on his face reminding her of uh, face paint that uh, traditionally I think Taino Indians would use and I just thought like how, well, how beautiful of a coincidence that was and that that's, that of course is not my intention like I described to you but to see his own mother sort of see that blue is not something that's taken away from him but resembling something that's a, that's a part of his heritage. So I, this this is maybe somewhat out of place, but when I talk to you all about like those uh, men that were known as paintings, my fraternity brothers, and thinking about this and the way we extend family, I think that's part of why that image was included there. I want to get to an image that shows you a sort of collection of these, and more of them in one place. So Jim Lee, another artist, an amazing artist, genius person, um, friend of mine, 
grateful to have in my life. So there are all different kinds of configurations that these uh, end up in. And this is a fuller picture of the uh, installation at the National. And with Indigo, yeah. So this was last year. That exhibit, um, I think, ran six months last in 2022. Fonz, Baby Boy. And this is most of the paintings in that series. I think Safe with them. Maybe like four of them are so aren't there. So the idea is to continue to build the series and to um, continue to invite people to sit. I think what I would like to do, given like conversations like this one, is to engage with in conversation, maybe more deliberate about like what kinds of adversity do men experience, not to sort of take away from just the casual, pleasant experience that I have with folks, but also to start to get more kind of insight about just how very our experiences are. Um, um, whether we've had these heightened experiences with, with racial difference with other kind of adversity or um, if you live like, you know, kind of the, the sweet life. But I think what I gather from probably every individual that I've painted so far in this series, a sense that their being black in America has had an impact on them and the differences in the way that they have responded to that, they process that, you know, whether someone has a therapist, whether someone really uh, confides in their loved ones to try to process things, whether they, they were unaware until something dramatic happened. And I think that's true for my, I believe that's true for my younger brother, we're 12 years apart, and that I think him growing up and him relating some of the experiences that he was having at school, I would be concerned about how some of his um, counterparts were interacting with him. He didn't seem, as a, say, as a uh, 13, 14 year old to, see, to be too concerned, but as in his 20s, he regularly sort of recounts the ways that people may try to use his, his race as a way to disadvantage him. So even if it's not something that's immediate, and um, unfortunately it seems like it's something that catches you, it maybe catches you off guard if you've lived a life where it like shielded from it. Um, so I'll, I'll stop, uh, I'll pause, um, just to give us a moment, myself a moment to breathe you all. My life experience is also through Instagram <laughs> and my, my, my curiosity and reflections. And I think it's, you probably can think of some example where, say, say, stealing bread for your hungry family might be an example of that, right? Is it like if, if it's against your own value to, to steal, what if you are trying to steal so, you're, so you can feed hungry people? So that's something along those lines. My, my, the example I probably had in my head was probably something I was. Uh, dealing with relationship-wise, uh, but still applies, and and it's a great place to kind of garner feedback. So I don't always have a, a kind of uh, opportunity to engage with an audience like this, like in person. So uh, social media becomes another way to uh, throw out questions that are on my mind. So in addition to sharing images, also sharing thoughts with people that are willing uh, to trade thoughts. Did you ever have anyone come back that you've done say? Oh, the wrong part. Oh. <laughs> I see it as very mental and verbal. Mental and verbal. I've had people talk about it that way. No, no one has said that um, that the wrong part was was colored blue, but uh, people have described it similarly, thinking that you know, it, it covering their head has something to do with sort of uh, psychological. Uh, and I think in the case of the older men having their mouths uh, covered covered blue. Um, to get it out there. What's that? They probably married a long time. <laughs> 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 I could relate to that. <laughs> Did you say you could relate to that? Uh, you have a child, right? Yes. How old is your child? So, uh, my daughter Indigo is almost two, and Indigo has older siblings, but Indigo is my first child. How would you paint your daughter? Is she I've painted Indigo, um, 
ones as uh, oh, based on the image that was uh, one of her sonogram images, like and and I painted her her and I together um, with her face, uh, both of our faces were turned away. My face turned away, and her face covered uh, with uh, her, her blanket. And I think I would. I've taken, we've taken tons of pictures of her since she's been born. Of course, like any like we like proud parent would. I'm really selective about what Im which images I might turn to paintings, but like the painting process for these other images, like that one in Mikey, that was like five years difference between the time I photographed and the time I made the painting. I think since we're raising a toddler, I haven't like spent as much time making new things with that kind of intention. Uh, but I see myself like painting her, <coughs> not painting her happy, but painting like the complexity. So I, I, I feel what my mom's saying in, in terms of not like being so fixated on this death thing. And so when I painted Indigo sonogram picture, she was blue as well, which I might have a, like a kind of like uh, sort of darker connotation. But it, but it didn't. The painting didn't register that way. Um, and she's Indigo, right? And so blue makes sense for her. Um, but like these men and boys, I think dignified is something that, for me that comes as a kind of uh, a given. It's not so much like I'm trying to paint them dignified, but what it, what is a, a criteria for me is that the light is right and it accentuates the form of their face. And I, I would never intentionally paint an image of someone that's like, that I don't think they look their best. So I, what I have had is when I've done commission paintings, people not thinking is the sort of idealized version of that of that person. With these paintings, I've never had anyone sort of complain about that, and maybe because I've invited them to to sit with me as opposed to them like paying me for it or a loved one paying for it. So I, there's not too many people that I, I think have expressed wanting their loved ones to be painted that way. But Jim Lee is an outlier in that. In that this was a commission painting. It is so he's. Linda's guy, uh, because Linda commissioned this painting and wanting him to specifically be represented that way. So I think a few people that whose thought processes are similar to mine see the value of significance in it, and she also sees the portraits in the way they're painted as, as in being empowering in themselves, um, and not everybody sees it that way. Yes, ma'am? When you started out earlier in the evening, you said Indigo Lou is almost two. And I wrote that down and thought you should do a little story that. Oh, thank you for that. Yeah, I didn't realize that. Yeah, yeah. 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 almost two. Thank you for that. She's a sweet. Longitude, you know, study of these people. You know, you take this person, women, women, who has the symbol. I mean, I like it. As a symbol, and then it's going to take generations. We're all working on it, trying, we're trying. We don't have the answers. We're struggling as we seek to rectify some of the distances. Yeah. But I can almost imagine that someone might have a crack mm -hmm. in his or her or his blueness where. Somehow the, the struggle is becoming a little bit easier. And they can eventually feel the way. I like that. I think you're saying that. And, and I wonder to some extent does the, the, the height isn't always the same. Right? So if that's part of representing that as well. And again, like uh, something that's maybe come through intuitively, not something I've done on purpose, but if, if it's how much of it's covering their nose or if it's lower, uh, if that starts to represent a similar idea. I was wondering if God's man still exists. Well, yeah, part of why I was hesitant when I said is the director. So my grandmother, unfortunately, she's been recovering from a stroke for like four years now. Um, and so she's been bedridden for most of that time. And God's gang, the ag urban ag work, uh, my uncles have been doing some of that, but since she's been down, less and less things have been happening like specifically. But but what's beautiful about that is that God's game really, even though we had the umbrella, it just was all of us, right? It was like the family and the people who experienced it when it was like at its height. So I think God's game, like 
really, I'm representing God's Gang right now, right? I'm not wearing a God's Gang shirt, but like the formal organization, there isn't much that that's happened as far as I know that continues to be done. Like this is a God's Gang event. It's just represented through like the young people going and doing things that resemble what we were doing back then, positive engagement with community. Which, I mean, it makes me think about like what ways that can be sort of enlivened again, but um, nobody is taking these like concrete steps to like take that over. She was the director and, and I think continues well, to be that. I'm just kind of wondering, you know, if there's philosophy and how organizations are. And, and I think she was encouraging us to do that and probably before, I mean, I've been in North Carolina for um, since 2011, so she was probably, probably were having conversations about the ways that I could and had to spend as much time <laughs> figuring out like how to, like the concrete ways to like make that happen. And so I, I do feel like her desire would be for us to be intentional about activating some, not if not the same identical program, but philosophies like you mentioned. Because um, when even when we were in Wisconsin, a couple of hours away, we considered ourselves God's game in Wisconsin. We weren't operating with the same level of intention that she was in Chicago, but we were trying to sort of share the ideas that we were learning um, in our respective communities. So I, I appreciate you saying that because it might be pushing me to really like do something about it and not sort of let it just sort of. Like there's a Facebook page that I realized like after, especially after she had her stroke, there was less and less things that were shared. Because what, even when she was, before that happened, she was sharing historic images and like newspaper articles and things. So it was like active, even if they weren't doing stuff all the time. So. We have a Sometimes, I, the, probably the excuse that I give myself is that there are so many organizations that do similar work that we don't need God's game to do it. But, so what that means is, it could go both directions. It could be me continuing to try to support organizations that are doing that kind of work, but also being intentional about the things that I learned with God's game being deployed again um, where I am now with communities that I, I do want to have a relationship with and an impact on. So, I will I'll do something about that so if you like like part of that, I think that'll be really important. And she was part of I would love to know about if she decided to do it or something like that. I should love that. Do you have all the sure we I, we have each other to make sure we had all the resources on it to like do something about it. Thank you. Yes. I just want to say I think your painting is beautiful. Mm -hmm. And what comes through for me is um, feeling of dignity in your subjects and a real humanity. I, I, I would love to see them in real life. Um, and I hope too. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, I'm glad we mentioned uh, Craven Allen. Uh, so, so that show will be me and a couple other paintings I really love. Uh, Clarence Hayward and Charles Williams. So I think that's at the end of August that that show opens up on Broad Street. So. I mean, Craig and Alex is, is here in the room. Oh, is that true? <laughs> is that true? Are they in August when we're slated to the show? September. August or September. Oh, September, okay. <laughs> but Craig and Alex, I think it would be the next time locally that you get to see the work. Thanks for being here. Are there other family members of yours that are involved in the arts and music or, or visual arts, uh, mm -hmm. like, you know, following? My brother is a musician. He does all kinds of like different music. It's so interesting because he transitioned from being like music high school, like being heavy on you know, like rock and metal and stuff, and then now he's doing more like hip hop, which I never uh, expected. But he's he's a really talented musician. My my sister played instruments growing up, and now is a stylist. Has an open up a shop and things. And I think some of the younger people, like people that are still like school age kids, are really showing some promise with it. But but. I think it would be really important for my generation to help guide that. And I think, like, so Mike is a great example in that. He's very talented, 
But I guess when we talk about adversity, he has all these other things that could steer him in a different direction. And so since we have this distance between us, uh, we're able to you know have conversations about it. But I, he's almost 18. 18, how serious was I? I feel like I always, I never gave myself any other option besides like making art. I always enjoyed it. So, and I'm trying, I'm wondering how intentional you have to be about guiding someone to like be that as a profession versus like making it a picture of their life. So I guess I would hope that Mikey as an example would just always be making and creating things, even if he doesn't decide to become a professional artist. Um, so there's, I would say for the younger generation there, more people that have like those skills. Nobody else I think that's doing like arts as a profession that comes to mind. Anthony might be the most serious person for doing that. Well, I don't know, but I've seen pictures of Indigo with a paintbrush in her hand. And of course. <laughs> 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 so um, I think we need to give well a big round of applause.